This is Push Gravity, Part 13. Halley's Comet returns approximately every 76 years. If any of the planets are in its path, then the comet will be deflected, or pushed, as Wright says, around that planet. As a matter of fact, if the massive planets Saturn and Jupiter are in its path, the comet will be delayed as much as 15 months in passing between them. The action of Halley's Comet as it approaches Saturn and Jupiter is shown in this push-gravity model of Wright's. This repulsive action supports Wright's gravity theory, which states there is a mutual repulsion between all bodies in space. This crater in Arizona, called Diablo Crater, might appear to make one question, Wright's first law of gravity, which tells us the closer two bodies get to each other in space, the greater is their mutual repulsion. If you will look at pictures of craters on the moon, Mercury, etc., you will see that they all appear to be created by dropping a round sphere straight down, such as the depression you would find if you dropped a steel ball into wet sand. You don't seem to find craters with long gouges, as would be found if an asteroid had come in at an angle. The Earth will push any intruding body away unless that body is traveling at a very high velocity and at a perfect 90-degree angle to our Earth. At a slower velocity or different angle, their mutual repulsion would push the intruder away. In his book, Wright explains the following action in Chapter 6, titled Velocity versus Repulsion. If an intruding body is traveling fast enough to overcome the initial mutual repelling forces between the Earth and this intruder, it will hit and then be pushed back into space. Wright says that is what happened to create this Arizona crater. The asteroid, which is about a mile in diameter, came in with such a high velocity their mutual repulsive factors failed to repel it before it struck. However, within a second after it hit, it was repelled back into space. There are four asteroids within worrying distance of the Earth that buzz the Earth constantly. These asteroids, which are each about a mile in diameter, are Acaris, Adonis, Apollo, and Hermes. It is possible one of these asteroids was responsible for the Arizona crater. At 7.17 a.m. on June 30, 1908, from many miles around Tunga, Siberia, a great ball of fire was seen, followed by three or four claps and a crashing sound. People 40 miles away from the ball of fire suffered flash burns, and the rush of warm air was felt many miles beyond that. Upon investigation, they discovered trees, as shown in this picture, scorched only on their exposed sides, laying on the ground in a radius of 20 miles. To their surprise, there was no impact crater or other evidence to indicate what had happened. Many theories have been suggested, but all have been rejected for one reason or another. The following is Wright's theory as to what happened that day at Tunga, Siberia. An asteroid directly approached Earth at a perfect 90-degree angle and as it entered the Earth's atmosphere, the heavy air caused the asteroid to become a red-hot ball. The tremendous force of the air shock wave caused by the asteroid leveled the trees, and the terrific heat caused them to be scorched and was responsible for the people's flash burns 40 miles away. The velocity of the intruder, unlike the one in the case of the Arizona crater, was not sufficient to overcome the mutual repulsion between the Earth and the asteroid. So the asteroid was stopped before it could hit the Earth and was pushed back into space. This would account for the lack of an impact crater. Wright believes the first loud noises heard, similar to sonic booms, were due to the decreasing velocity of the asteroid that was still exceeding the speed of sound as it approached Earth, or perhaps an echo effect. The last noise, a crashing sound, was undoubtedly due to the large vacuum being filled with air behind the asteroid when it was stopped prior to impact. The following was found on page 102 of a book titled Einstein's Universe. Quote, if Einstein was right, the sun ought to seem to push stars outwards from their normal positions in relation to other stars. Unquote. 
Wright believes that our sun not only pushes other stars outwards from their normal positions in relation to other stars, but he thinks our sun exerts a mutual repulsion between all bodies in space. This push gravity model on the screen supports Wright's theory, and apparently that of Einstein, that the sun pushes stars. Wright adds the following, only in the interest of medical research, but calls your attention to the fact that the heart, pictured on the screen, also exerts a push gravity force. Wright has noticed that most organs of the body are subject to cancer except the heart. Even though it pumps cancerous blood, leukemia, the heart is rarely affected. We all know the heart is a muscle, and the fact that it is seldom affected might indicate muscles are more or less immune to cancer. As a suggestion, why not graft a small section from a muscle to a cancerous organ to see if it would impede cancerous growth, or better yet, stop its growth entirely? It seems this suggestion should be worthy of consideration. This is Wright's tide model, which uses a 12-inch beach ball to represent the Earth. In order to produce a high tide on both the front and back of the Earth at the same time, all you need do is apply force to the sides of the Earth. When pressure is applied to the sides of the Earth, this pressure forces the airfield beach ball to expand in front and back. You will notice that when pressure is applied to both sides of the beach ball, the front of the ball expands. This expansion causes an electrical contact to be made, which picks up a relay and turns off the low tide light on the left and turns on the high tide light on the right. The Earth's magnetic north pole opposes the Moon's magnetic north pole and the Earth's magnetic south pole opposes the Moon's magnetic south pole. This means that the Earth and Moon's magnetic fields repel each other. In this model, when the Moon, a bar magnet, is moved toward the Earth, the Earth's magnetic lines of force, represented here by repelling magnets, will move toward the sides of the Earth. This, in turn, applies pressure to the sides of the Earth and forces the Earth to expand in both the front and back giving us two high tides at the same time. You will notice when the moon is moved toward the Earth, the low tide light goes out and the high tide light on the right side comes on. Scientists report the strength of the Earth's magnetic lines of force change between high and low tides, which adds additional support to Wright's tide theory. The small expansion of one-eighth inch on this model is comparable to an 80-mile high tide on Earth. When you consider the beach ball is one foot in diameter and the Earth is over 40 million feet in diameter. Earth has its highest tides when the moon, the sun, and the Earth are in line with each other. In this demonstration, the moon is facing the Earth, but the low tide light on the left is purposely left on for this experiment. When the sun is moved toward the Earth, its additional repelling energy, combined with the moon's repelling energy, moves the Earth's magnetic field further to the sides, increasing the pressure on the sides of the Earth, and the low tide light on the left goes out, and the high tide light on the right comes on. This increased repelling action explains why the tides are the highest when the sun and the moon are in line facing the Earth. When the sun is at a left angle to the moon, that area of the Earth facing the sun and the moon has a low tide. This demonstration places the moon in front facing the Earth, and the high tide light on the right is on. When the sun is placed at a left angle to the moon, the magnetic repelling energy of the sun rearranges the Earth's lines of force, causing the pressure points on the sides of the Earth to decrease, and the high tide light on the right goes out, and the low tide light on the left comes on. When the sun is at a right angle to the moon, that area of the Earth facing the sun and the moon has a low tide. This demonstration places the moon in front facing the Earth, and the high tide light on the right is on. When the sun is placed at right angles to the moon, the magnetic repelling energy of the sun rearranges the Earth's lines of force causing the pressure points on the sides of the Earth to decrease 
and the high tide light on the right goes out and the low tide light on the left comes on. You have just seen Wright support his tide theory by physically demonstrating the four most talked about tides here on Earth. First, a high tide in the area where the moon is facing the Earth. Second, a higher tide in the area where the moon and the sun are in line facing the Earth. Third, a low tide in the area of Earth where the sun is at left angles to the moon. And fourth, a low tide in the area of Earth where the sun is at right angles to the moon. For 20 years, Wright has researched Newton's theory of our tides with an open mind and so far has found nine different explanations for our tides, but no models to support any one of them. Wright finds all their explanations questionable, including the one shown on the screen, which he found on page 7172 of the World Book Encyclopedia, Volume T, copyright in 1938. Quote, the sun pulls the earth with 175 times the force that the moon does. On the other hand, the moon has a greater tide-producing force, unquote. A confusing explanation with no model to support it. Wright will now discuss his push gravity theory as it relates to our ability to remain on earth rather than floating out into space. The following comment by Albert Einstein, found on page 3127 of the World Book Encyclopedia, copyrighted in 1953, might come as a surprise to you. Quote, Objects are pushed toward the Earth by the gravitational field rather than pulled by Earth. Unquote. Likewise, Wright believes objects are pushed toward the Earth by the gravitational field and not pulled by Earth. Wright has a working model, which he will demonstrate shortly, that supports this part of his push gravity theory. Wright also theorizes that Earth's gravity originates on the Sun and eight minutes later arrives here on Earth within the force of the Sun's emitted energy. Wright says this emitted force from the sun envelops the earth, pushing all bodies down to the earth. Our sun is a magnet with both north and south poles. The magnet, which you will see on the screen, represents the sun and will attract the little iron astronaut figure which is hanging in space. This is due to a basic law of magnetism that tells us magnets attract iron. I will now introduce this two-inch blue iron ball, which will represent our Earth. In this model, the iron astronaut is hanging one-eighth of an inch from Earth. In space, this one-eighth inch would actually be a distance of 500 miles between the astronaut and Earth. When the little iron astronaut is held against the Earth by manual power and then released, it returns to its original hanging position. In this demonstration, when the sun moves closer to the Earth, the force of the sun's emitted magnetic energy envelops the Earth and provides the power that pushes the iron astronaut down to the Earth. This action directly contradicts that basic law of magnetism, which says magnets attract iron. Now, as the sun is moved away, decreasing the enveloping force surrounding the Earth, the small iron astronaut once again falls away. This is a picture of a total eclipse of our Sun. The emitted magnetic energy shown here surrounding the Sun travels through space at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. When this magnetic energy reaches our Earth, which takes only eight minutes, its enveloping force pushes objects down to Earth and adds support to Wright's theory that Earth's gravity could originate on the Sun. The Sun is our light, our heat, and also provides the needed elements to support our plant life. 
So why can't the sun provide one more essential ingredient required to sustain life here on Earth, our gravity? Mr. Sylvan Wall, a retired California science teacher, wrote this comment in Wright Space Museum guest book after a tour through his museum. Quote, I wish I had had these models available when I taught science. Unquote. This is Wright's handheld push gravity model, consisting of only six magnets that can depict nearly every space action that Mr. Wall saw demonstrated by the larger space action models in Wright's museum. Educators, students, and members of the general public have been buying these educational models since they discovered that learning about space science can be fun. Wright has found that the majority of students and educators who have viewed a demonstration of push gravity have no difficulty relating to his theory. This excerpt from a letter to Wright from a college science class is typical of the response from most students. Quote, however, the most telling argument that Wright has is that while he has models of his push theory, there are no such models for the traditional pull theory, unquote. Hank Matamore, supervisor of the Fairfield Senior Center, wrote to the television educational programming director for KQED Channel 9 in San Francisco, California, encouraging him to send a crew to film Wright Space Museum. Within his letter, Mr. Matamor wrote the following, quote, My son was turned on more by Wright's Museum than he was by Berkeley's Lawrence Hall of Sciences, unquote. Perhaps the following quotation could apply to the origin of Wright's push gravity theory. Quote, Discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has seen, but thinking what nobody else has thought. Unquote. This film segment, Push Gravity Part 12, has exposed only the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, in regard to Wright's theory on push gravity. His theory has been supported many times over by his accurate space predictions, space formulas, and space models. This presentation has only laid down the cornerstone, but hopefully the scientific community can add many building blocks. Wright realizes that no one man is an island, and his only desire is to leave this theory behind to be studied by open-minded members of the scientific community who recognize that in the past, many of our universally accepted theories have been proved wrong. Wright believes his desire epitomizes the theme of this sixth Global Sciences Congress entitled Partners in the Search. Wright would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank Mr. Dean Stonier for giving him the opportunity to present his controversial push gravity theory here at the sixth annual Global Sciences Congress on August 20th, 1988. This film segment, Push Gravity Part 12, is dedicated to Mr. Jim Benson. Your narrator has been Darlene Brown. <laughs>